Hello. Hi. Hey, friends. Welcome to the next panel. We're uh, happy to have you. Hope you get buckled right in because this is going to be a drive through a lot of amazing content talking about storytelling in games as a medium. Um, before we kick off, I just want us to each introduce ourselves. Um, who wants to go first? I vote not me. <laughs> that ain't fair. Patrick. All right. Uh, the eyes have it. Uh, I'm Patrick. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Hoverbird. Um, I'm the creative director on NeoCab, um, a game that's also showing at Ludo Yeah, uh, I, 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 I guess I could. Uh, that it? I don't know how long we, we have for intros, but. <laughs> Maybe a little more. Like, okay. why we should listen to you. Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I, uh, before, so yeah, uh, NeoCab is a narrative game, uh, and I think we've done some really interesting, uh, hopefully good, but definitely interesting, um, new stuff with, uh, emotional gameplay mechanics, um, and our game is definitely about, um, empathy, uh, the ups and downs of empathy, um, maybe the uses and misuses of empathy, which I think is something we'll hopefully talk about later, um, so we've explored that design space and I'm excited to, to talk about it and talk about other games and what they've done. Um, before this, I was at Campo Santo um, working on Firewatch where I did um, design work, programming, um, tools, a little bit of writing. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been like a, just a lifelong lover of narrative games, like uh, going back to basically when I was five, I would say stories have always been what drove me most about a game that I truly loved. Um, and yeah, that goes back to the Commodore 64 and the NES. Like it was always the manual, <laughs> the box, the feelies is part of the game for me. And I still, I guess I'm chasing that feeling of immersion um, that a great game world and uh, a great protagonist um, can, can do uniquely, uniquely well. Sounds super cool. Is this where we have a stare off until someone breaks and oh, does no, the introduction next? I, I vote you, Cassandra. God damn it, I should shut up. <laughs> that was your one GD bomb. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I'm a script writer at Ubisoft Montreal. Before this, I guess I've done a little bit of everything. I've written for indie games, um, Sunless Skies, Falcon Age. I did about a six year stint in tech and video games with The Verge and Gadget all over the place. I've published books uh, with Tor.com and Rebellion Publishing, did tabletop games, and before that, I was an AI programmer. Cool. That sounds That's awesome. Quite a list. I get bored easily. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, our turn. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Strix. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the underscore Strix, S T R I X. And uh, I am currently a project narrative director at Hidden Path Entertainment, um, working on a big old game that's unannounced. It's very exciting. Uh, previously, I was at um, Eline Media doing the game um, Beyond Blue, which is the successor to Never Alone, if you ever played that. Um, and I've written a whole bunch of stuff freelance style. Um, I got my start in live action theater and tabletop RPGs. Um, last year, my tabletop RPG, Bluebeard's Bride, um, won IndieCade's Grand Jury Awards. So that was really exciting. Oh, um, I think it was the first tabletop RPG to ever do that. Um, and uh, otherwise, I'm also a gaming academic. I focus on the intersection between mythology, psychology, and play. I have several peer-reviewed papers you can go read for free. Um, and I am a diversity and inclusion consultant and advocate. Because... Games are for everybody. True facts. Uh oh, hang on one second. There we go. I was getting I was getting audio feedback from a different place. Um, so uh, that's me. That's all of us. Um, by the way, my pronouns are she/her. Um, if you guys want to introduce your pronouns, I'm he/him or they. Down for both. She/her. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have like 45 minutes to cover like a really awesome subject, which is. Um, you know, what kind of storytelling happens in games and how is it different from storytelling that happens in other places. So we plan to, we'll see how it works out, broach three topics. Um, and the first of those topics is um, interactivity in the idea that um, 
interactivity heightens storytelling in games in particular as a medium um, because your brain is actually interacting with things differently than it would if it was just passively absorbing something like a movie. Um, so I'd love to start um, this conversation by going to Cassandra. Um, and I would love for you to share your thoughts on, on interactivity uh, and our medium. Um, oh God, jumping right into a deep end there. Uh, I guess when I think about interactivity and I think about games and how it's uniquely positioned to bring us deeper into the narrative, Near Automata has always been my go-to. And if you haven't played it, it is kind of like a cyberpunk thing. There is an android girl. She has an operator that helps her. She has a blindfold. Her dressing is slightly questionable. She has a very large sword. And the action bits of it are great. You kind of barrel through something that, while it's interesting, feels a little bit rote in the beginning. You get to the first ending, things start to unlock. And it repeats. There are deaths. The characters get re-uploaded into new bodies, and it just goes on and on and on. And slowly you kind of realize that the entire game is working on the cyclical level. People are just getting slowly ground down and exhausted by the hopelessness. And while you have a lot of apocalyptic movies and books out there, Near Automata worked because it just kind of pulled you in and made you do things, it made you be precise, it forced you to be good at the bosses, forced you to stay good at combat, and just wore you down and kind of left you emotionally broken by the ending. And I don't think there is any other medium right now that really supports the ability to like pass on that emotion on somebody else. I don't know how to pass it on to anyone else. I'm <laughs> hoping the silence would be taken as a cue. I'm terrible at this. No, it's totally fine. Um, so when I think about interactivity in games like um, near, I always call it near automata. I, I, I miss the extra syllable, I think, um, is um, the reasons why it ropes you in. I think it goes along the lines of what you said is you're really focused on the actions and the um, interactivity is kind of interspersed both there but through the narrative as well. So they're really tightly bound together. Um, when I think about interactivity and storytelling games, I go immediately to the, the psychology, the science of it, in that um, you know, we found that um, when you are play acting a thing, when you're pretending to be a thing, like pretending to be a video game character, and you're actually interacting with it versus just watching it, um, a part of your brain, the front part of the brain, knows that what you're doing is just a game and it's not real. Um, but the back part of your brain, the lizard brain, the amygdala, does not know that it is not real. And so it absorbs the experience like it is a real experience. Um, and what that does is, depending on what you're consuming, um, it can promote like psychological growth because now you have experiential knowledge of this thing without taking the risk of actually doing it in person, right? And so that's one of the elements of interactivity in games that makes me super interested in it as a powerful medium. Um, and I think um, we see more of that in games where you're more bodily involved. So that would be things like VR. Uh, it would be things like LARPs, which I love. You can diss on LARPs all you want, whatever. We're not cool, but it's awesome. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, so that's kind of my perspective on it. Um, what about you, Patrick? Um, wow, it's so hard to add to what folks have already said, because um, I feel like we've touched on two of the main points. Um, the, the sort of looping and ever deepening nature of an engagement with one game spent over time that I feel like Cassandra was talking about is so unique. Um, I mean, just like you can watch movies, a movie that you love multiple times and you get something different out of it each time. But um, it's not the same as getting a totally different ending, right? It's not the same as not knowing what the ending space even is until you've fully explored it. So that that feeling of sort of bottomlessness and of um, you know what's what's going on in the system and what's going on between my ears is is so fascinating to me um, and then I, I think just to like jump on what you were saying Strix 
the the way that a, an immersive game experience makes everything sort of fall away. And I never heard that sort of like neuroscience explanation for it, but I've I've felt that where you don't question your experience as real. It feels like it's something that is that is happening to you. Um, and that emotions that are felt that way that aren't they're not mediated where you're like, oh, that happened to that person and I I I empathize with that person and I I you know like reason through their struggle. Um, it's so different when it's like, oh no, that happened to me. That just that just like short circuited all of my like layers of defense and um like uh yeah like a brain i guess thinking and get get got to the and that's um i felt that and it's like super real uh but also really hard to design for i think mm -hmm. so I'm excited to um get into that um one other thing that i would add for me is um i really love uh how games approach uh exploring systems and especially how that uh interfaces with a first person characters experience within the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, like a game like uh, Cart Life, where you're simultaneously like, I don't know, if, you know, I don't know if I have to introduce it much, but you're, but in, in one of the character playthroughs, you know, you're an immigrant, you're uh, missing your family back home, you're dreaming about them. And then at the same time, you're trying to feed your cat without getting fired at your job, you know? And the way that that ties into the price of the bus versus the time it takes to walk, the price of cat food, the number of times you can get a pass with your landlord for having a pet you're not allowed to. Like the way that those systems of the mundane or the societal superstructure can all be at play while you're also living um, a, a story that's very personal and like finding your own place within the system is like just totally unique to games. There's nothing like, I mean, the closest I could think of for a piece of like linear media that approaches systems thinking that way that I know of is like The Wire. Um, and- Which is a good show, like- It's great, yeah, right. And like you understand how like local governments fail and how society lets down underprivileged, you know, like a way that, yeah, it's fucking amazing, but it's still not the same as trying like a game where you try to survive as a drug dealer on the corner or you try to survive as a public school teacher trying not to fail your kids with within the budget you know like there's i feel like every um like uh what do they call them like a perspective character perspectival character in the wire could have a narrative game written about a week of their time or a year of their time and that that would allow exploration of themes that like the linear show couldn't touch because of the constraints of that form. So what I am hearing you say, maybe I'm getting this right or maybe I'm not, and you can correct me, is you think that um, story games and stories told through games allow us to interrogate our human systems more robustly than we would through a passive medium. Do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, a, a, a linear show could, can gesture at that, but it doesn't have the, without interactivity, how do you feel the the overall shape of the system, right? Like, um, in you know, when you watch a movie, people constantly be like, well, if I was in that case, I never would have done that. I mean, people love this kind of fandom, right? Like, Game of Thrones, like, oh, pff, Tyrion, what a mistake. Like, how could you do that? How, how dumb? You know, well, um, in a game, you have the opportunity potentially to make that mistake, see the repercussions, learn something, and then try it again, right? So you're you're mapping out the possibility space in a way that um, only an interactive medium can do. Cool. Can, Cassandra, what are your thoughts on interrogating systems and, and narrative? Um, Sightlight by, I think, the whole description of the intimacy and how just getting drawn into the systems of that just puts you in the different headspace. Mm -hmm. Like I've always actually it kind of bounced off movies and TV a lot because I'm really sensory oriented. I'm curious about smells, um, tastes, sensation very often. And you know, visual media doesn't always convey that very well. Books do it amazingly like you get to a book they're going to describe every taste and if they layer it exactly just that memory just kind of kicks in 
um, everything for the first moment, let's say a slice of pizza touches your tongue, the way the warm settles, the cheese, the aftertaste, they do it well enough, they describe it well enough, you kind of float into it. But with books, it feels very often like you have to almost agree to it. You have to accept the experience. And games kind of can games can kind of trick you into it even if you don't feel like doing it at the moment life is strange too um stuck in my head for that reason i remember loading it up just on a whim and thinking you know i'm going to spend like a few minutes on this i i'm not going to last of it had teenagers getting ready for a party they were just chatting and i'm like let's get to a safe point and i'm going to go like i'm done and i get into the house and you're playing as this um, young uh, teenage boy and he goes into the house, he, the little brother is there, the dad is there, they're arguing about this chocolate bar and like, who gets to have it? And you can even decide, you can decide between the two of them, you can take the chocolate bar yourself, they go off to their separate rooms, it's a weirdly intimate feeling. And you are given a task by initial character, it's like, go get snacks, go get some booze. And I remember walking through their house, like peering at recipe lists, opening up the fridge, rummaging through the closets. And before I knew it, I was incredibly invested in the characters. And I think it just ties back to what you said earlier. Like the lizard brain is so familiar with this actions, looking for food, like looking for your parents, talking to someone in your family, that mind just kind of just went, okay, this is my family. I want to see what happens to them next. And it's, it's just the weirdest feeling. I know it's just a loop. I know this was intended, but it worked. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, um, how, does, how does the design of that particular scene make it, make it feel personal to you? Like, what about that choice would you say? Like, or is that what's happening? Is that it's like, um, it feels like that because of the choice that it's, it's personal, it's your story? Or is it, is it more about the, perspective of the characters or I'm curious I guess uh also it's life is strange too I'm so glancing at the chat um I think they made it personal by just borrowing gestures and memories that all of us have we've mm -hmm. all wanted to go to our parents and you know ask them for something we've all had to check in with our parents we've wandered through our houses looking for specific things not sure where they are because maybe somebody did a grocery run recently and i guess the systems and patterns again that is what was yeah. strangely personal hmm. yeah like a uh, uh, tacoma and gone home felt that way absolutely for me is my my body just like fell away and i was the person snooping through these spaces and connecting the dots and it just yeah i forgot that i was playing a game i felt like um well, that's a little different. I definitely felt like immersed, but I didn't feel like it was my family personally. Maybe a little bit more with, with Gone Home, where it did kind of feel like this could be my family, this could be my life, this could be my little sister. Mm -hmm. I think I felt the same way with Tacoma. Um, like I really wanted to get close to these people who were not actually there and I was just seeing shadows of. Um, and like, if you really think about what's happening in Tacoma, like you are snooping through the most private, intimate, detailed parts of these people's lives, uh, unfettered, and in any other circumstance, it would be completely socially taboo, right? And illegal, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> very illegal. Um, but it does not stop you for even like an eye blink. You're like, I wanna know, like, are they really sleeping together? Let's go check their room, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, I just thought it was really masterful in um, its characterization and how it made that very strong. And sure, the whole plot is about like freeing an AI or stealing an AI and bringing it back to a corporation, but it, not really, right? That's the framing narrative um, for the majority of the game, which is actually just experience these things with these people. Right, right. Um, so that kind of segues into a, maybe a side conversation we want to have for a couple of minutes, and that's um, interactivity in games with story where you're not the only real player. Like multiplayer? Like multiplayer. Um, how, how do we feel uh, multiplayer uh, fits within the interactivity lens today? 
probably obvious, but very difficult to do well, um, but incredibly fulfilling. And yeah, maybe I personally think it's probably one of the like, most like promising areas of exploration like that are out there. Like we know there's so much design space there um, that hasn't been explored. And I think a lot of it is because of like basic safety, griefing, um, uh, trolling, all those behaviors um, make it, you know, um, you have to limit the model by default to keep it safe. Um, but I'm very interested in like economic models where it could, where there you could open up more expressiveness and interactivity between real people in real time mm -hmm. while keeping, keeping it safe uh, and accessible for everyone. Um, I think I'm really fascinated with more intimate multiplayer games where it's like two players, three players. Um, I'm thinking of Dark Souls. Uh, what was that yeah. new one? Ashen? Mm. Journey. Um, little things that play with the idea of like half their own gimmicks and half their own ideas and just forces you to stay together without thinking of people going to troll. Uh, Divinity's interesting. Divinity Original Sin 2, it allows for the trolling in a way that feels completely natural. Mm -hmm. If you have the kind of friends who will randomly set off dry ice car bombs just because. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's one approach is to build trolling and griefing into the system, which I feel, yeah, like Dark Souls does. And it, you know, like there's no text messages to, you know, um, the only message you can send are templatized, which keeps it safe from like racist and bigoted trolling. But um, yeah, if you if your goal is to with multiplayer is to ruin someone else's day, that's part of the the Dark Souls experience. And so at least, um, uh, yeah, I guess it self selects for people who want to do that or who are willing to have that extremely frustrating experience and uh, make that part of their their story. Yeah, I actually think um, developers need to claim more authority over and responsibility towards the mechanics of their games and the social outcomes that those will spawn. Um, you, you know, in video games right now, we have a pretty small number of verb words. You know, hit the thing with a stick, run away, jump, maybe hit the thing with a sword or a projectile, and that's a lot of games. Um, but there are many, many other verbs and many, many action mechanics that we could build into beautiful games um, that would, by default, have no space for that kind of griefing. And I think that's one solution. Um, I also think we are on a frontier and we are learning the tools that we need to make games that maybe are adversarial, um, adversarial in a way that works. Uh, and I look forward to co the continuing research and development that is happening in that space. We're figuring out, like, basically, we're figuring out game sociology, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not just mechanics. It's we got to figure out how people work in groups in this space, yeah. um, which is really cool. Yeah. Did, did you, uh, either of you hear the, um, there's a podcast. It might have been Invisibilia or um, Reply All. I can't remember. Sorry. But uh, it was about um, this girl who lost her grandma and recreated her grandma in The Sims and had this like long storytelling and grieving process that was totally personal to her around making her grandma's house and visiting her grandma every day when like in her own life, her parents had kind of hidden the grandma's death from her. You know, like she, there was like no funeral, she never got to say goodbye. I don't know, did you hear that? It was like- No, it sounds very touching though. <laughs> it was super touching and, and fascinating about like, yeah. Like I, I, had for, I hadn't thought about the sins in years, but uh, but it was like, this is the most immersive story world I've ever heard. Where she, and then she eventually had to let her grandma die. But that process of like letting virtual grandma go. Um, oh, and another another interesting part was there was like a mod community around like black sims because the sims like stock characters don't have a lot of like the materials you'd find in like a Southern black family home. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to like customize her game. I feel like that's another big piece is like fan, fan mods. Like if you really want multiplayer personal games, like at some point you've got to give up some control and let people like literally inject themselves and their own art into the, into the game. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to sidle us to our, our next subject now, because we actually kind of hit two of them that we had planned above the three. Um, so I just want to check in with you two. Um, we had talked about systems briefly, um, 
in storytelling? Do we feel like we have more room there to, to say more expansive things? Or would you rather um, tackle a new subject next? I probably have more to say, but I could leave it for the end. Oh, sorry, were you gonna say, Cassandra? About the same thing you were gonna say. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, moving on then. Um, so suspension of disbelief is an interesting topic for narrative games because we face the same barrier in our entertainment medium as a lot of other entertainment mediums, um, especially movies. And you always know when suspension of disbelief breaks because you're like, what the hell is that that I am watching? I don't understand. This is, this is dumb. Um, so talking about the role of suspension of disbelief for narrative games, um, how do we think we make it well? Where does it come from? What can we do with it? And I'm just gonna leave that out there for one of you two to pick up. Not it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I keep thinking of papers, please, with that question. And how that slow progression of systems where you're just checking everyone, making sure the visas and the passports are going, you go home, you worry about your personal life, and it just goes on and on. And I think more than one player is like, this feels kind of repetitive, but you know, we're here to do a thing. Like, there's a short goal. And that bait and switch, when they make you care about it, mm -hmm. it's fascinating because if you think about it, you're playing an immigration officer for a fictional country in a horrible setting it's not exactly something that's intimate mm. and i think the biggest triumph of that game in a way is forcing people to think about who's on the other side as well because um immigration and movement across the world is a very touchy topic in this days yeah 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 papers please is brilliant at that like um you said in our our like lead up to this conversation cassandra like a something like a good game is a magic trick that i get that right um and yeah papers please is remarkable that way because um first of all it's always good to remember that you can have a very simple and abstract art style and still be immersive like i think a lot of people when they think of an immersive game they think i need full body awareness and uh beautiful reflections and you know like all i basically photorealism or something or um and but the trick of papers please is because it simulates that aspect of the job so well you fall away and then when a character comes in who's a real character and not just another nameless uh, face you right you re respond to them like they're one of your regulars and then building up that i feel like they did just a, such a brilliant job of like i'm thinking of that guy who's always trying to scam you um you know because right because like we've all dealt with that if you've ever worked in retail like right there's like someone who's just trying to get a freebie and at first you're like fuck off dude like you're not fooling anybody like but then you, he's so brazen, you care about him, and then eventually you want to help the scammer, um, even at potentially your own expense, the expense of your family. Um, that's right, that's such a, that's the trick, I guess, is they've like made you care about narrative and show you that you care about narrative more than your core gameplay, high score, et cetera, like approach to video games that um, is still so, prevalent and people still assume is like what players care about is like um, all they want is like to max out any particular stat. And I'm, I'm hoping that that myth will start to fall away and, and maybe it only will when more games approach ways of like disrupting the minimax like play style and show you there's like a more interesting way to play most games. What do you think, Cassandra? Um. I think I'm really curious about what's going to happen if VR becomes more mainstream. Uh, not going to name the game because I don't know if I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to name the game now that I think about it. So I'm just going to tell you it's a VR game that involves being a space fighter. And I remember talking to one of the designers and he was discussing how VR leaves us kind of nauseous. Sometimes there are people who can't do it. I can't do more than a minute or so on VR without wanting to throw up. And when you die in the game, they wanted to work it so you felt yourself being yanked out of body to convey the idea that you were being both simultaneously, you're a clone, simultaneously killed and uploaded into the next batch. And 
yeah, in the lead up to this panel, you had some really interesting things to say about that um, consent, in a sense. And I'm really interested, we're interested in what's going to happen on the field. And I'm also really interested in seeing uh, how developers are going to react to that out of body experience that VR sometimes offers. Because I know personally when I've tried it and I'm trying to pet something that's fluffy, I can almost feel my hand demanding I notice mm. that it's there. And it's such a weird sensation. But yeah, what do you think about, I guess this is a cyber, consent and VR and mechanics like that strikes. Oh, I have so many feelings. Um, <laughs> so I deal a lot with ethics in games because I come from the live action space where you're touching each other and you're in really vulnerable positions with each other in person, in meat space. So we've been having this conversation for a long time. And as we watch you know, the, the nascent form of VR kind of go forward into the world, I think they have a lot of lessons to learn from, from the live action community actually. Um, but also to make sure that they continue to interrogate ethics. Um, because um, if a responsible developer, I think, I would hope, would say, hey, um, we intend for this to be uncomfortable. It could make you nauseous. That's something that's bad for your body. So we want to let you know that's happening. So you can either choose not to play the game or opt out of that part. Um, and if the developer doesn't do that and you're just hit with nausea, well, do you fall over and you hit your head? Do you already have a condition that's going to be exacerbated? Um, this is actually like a physical safety thing. And also, like, maybe I don't want to feel nauseous because I have to go to work in two minutes and I can't drive while nauseous, right? So I think those experiences are good if used appropriately um, and with consent. But if they are not, I think it causes huge problem. It undermines player trust. Um, it makes the field really unclear for what is and is not okay. Um, and I think it's actually not that hard to figure out. Like if you sit and say, would I want someone to do this to me without my <laughs> permission? And the answer is no, then probably that is the guideline that you want to take. Um, I mean, ethics in games uh, and in game experiences in VR are only going to get more complex. You know, at some point we're going to be able to shoot nanos into our bloodstream and, you know, there we go, PS9. Um, but uh, it, as we get more and more embodied and we put more on the line physically and we integrate more physically with hardware, there's going to have to be a robust conversation and system of ethics around it um, in order to sustain and support it uh, in a way that, you know, makes the, um, makes the environment good for everybody that wants to participate. So right, right. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's it's not just the right thing to do. It's also the only way your product will succeed on the long haul, right? Like if people don't feel safe um, or don't, I mean, obviously, if, 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 your, if your product makes people violently ill, uh, they're not going to use it again. <laughs> um, but, but it's also, yeah, it's also just the right thing to do. Um, and I think everything you said also ties into multiplayer environments, like you were saying before, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I can imagine the LARP, LARP and tabletop RPG space. What's the name of that? There's some like um, code for like a general purpose tabletop RPG thing around consent where you can sort of like, you know what I'm talking about, Strix? It's like you can raise your hand if something is crossed the, the bounds. The X card? X card, right, exactly. So like, you know, is that like a base level ingredient that needs to be there for like any multiplayer experience perhaps? And like, is there a VR X card? Um, like that could be, I don't know, it's an interesting question. Like, is there some VR gesture or something that you could implement across all VR games so you'd always know how to like say like, whoa, Stop I'm tapping thing. out. Yeah. That's actually a really great idea. I'm gonna tell John about this. Um, John Strabolopoulos is the inventor of the X card. He's also my oh. friend. Uh, and the X card has had a pretty long life in tabletop, but maybe it's time for it to jump into digital. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it's I guess for VR, it's that. Uh, uh, but but you, but maybe not. Like that's actually what's interesting. Is some people are so immersed in VR, you might actually forget you have a body, uh, mm -hmm. and and you might tense up a little bit. And unless you had like a diegetic gesture, like maybe you'd be kind of screwed. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I could see that scenario actually perfectly well. Um, so I feel like this brings us into the conversation we want to have about empathy and um, how game narrative specifically evokes empathy as opposed to other narrative mediums. 
Um, and what we think is going on with empathy in games and why it is or is not important. Not it. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you do I'll that to me again. Me up. I guess I said earlier I had to, that I had something to say about it. Um, I think it's it's been really interesting to see the conversation around empathy uh, evolve over the past few years because I was I was definitely one of those people uh, around when I started Neocab who was like beating the drum the empathy drum beat harder than anybody and saying which I still believe that games are uniquely capable of delivering empathy because of um, because of some of the things we talked about already, like personal identification with the, with the character, immersion, like, you know, the old like cliche of like walk a mile in someone's shoes um, feels like most possible with like, I would say games and like fiction, um, fiction because of the interiority, games because of the like first person perspective and the interactivity. Um, so I still believe that, that games are uniquely able to um, generate empathy um but but i'm also like uh i don't know I, I feel like there's been a little bit of a backlash now which is kind of interesting around like is empathy the highest goal um who do we want who do we choose to have empathy for mm -hmm. um and uh I, and uh and also like it's not i think it's clear that it's not the only goal right there it's also okay to be escapist and to want to be somebody totally different um so, uh, and not, I, don't, I don't know, I, I think that's what, I, what I'd love to talk about is like what, ga what games are like delivering the kind of empathy that we think we want to have more of um, and how are they doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think we should kind of contextualize this conversation by saying like, at least me, I don't think all games should promote, um, you know, fuzzy feeling of, of empathy. I think, however, we are a spectrum of art, just like film is a spectrum of art. And right. there is a lot of room to do that. Like I love jumping on Diablo three or Soul Calibur and just murdering people for <laughs> hours. I get such pleasure out of that. But at the same time, in a different mood on a different day, I want to play Journey or I want to play hashtag self care or I want to do any of the other types of experiences that are available on the other end of the spectrum. And I think building room for those experiences is really important. Um, as far as like what actually works in building empathy, I think for me, um, it has to be grounded in the experiential. Um, so you could write five paragraphs, right, on a screen in a quest log for your character that says all of the horrible things that have happened to this race of characters, and isn't it so bad, go solve the problem. And you go, okay, I need three line heads and two mushrooms, got it, right? Um, whereas if it's, constructed as an experiential thing, you might walk through a village and see a hungry child or see someone with bandages or someone may come up to you and beg for food or, um, you know, any number of things where then you're in it and you're like, oh man, this is, I got to do something about this because I see the suffering and I want to address it. Um, so that's the difference between having a narrative where we're telling you to feel the thing because it's bad and being experiential with the narrative and saying, come um, get a taste of this. And mm -hmm. I, I think that one is probably more successful most of the time than yeah. just long, long lines of dialogue. I think it's interesting. So like, there's also another element for like building empathy here that um, the mechanics of games allows us. Games allow us to feel responsible for a character. Um, they can tie it, uh, let's say it's a simulation game hypothetically, mm -hmm. you get invested in your citizens. They have little names, you watch the shops grow, you watch the houses build up, army comes over and obliterates them and you're like, hey. And I think it's an interesting mechanic that um, could be integrated in more games, but on like a more subtle level, the walking dead did that really well. It put the responsible, you want everyone to live because as a player, you're like, this is my goal. Clearly, the best thing to do is have everyone survive and get to the end. So building empathy through game mechanics and our habits as a player is a very interesting thing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The Walking Dead is, is definitely a touchstone for me. Uh, the Walking Dead season one, I should say, is like a real touchstone for me as well with empathy in games. And 
probably not coincidentally self-identification with the character, with their choices, with the outcomes of their choices. Um, yeah, it was de definitely one of those where it's like, oh, this is, this is something only games could do. The way I'm feeling right now, I don't actually think I could imagine a movie or a book or an opera or a theater piece make me feel, maybe an interactive theater piece, but that's it, could make me feel this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, okay, so we have five or six minutes, six or seven minutes, something like that. Um, so I thought we could close out with a quick discussion on ciphers, what they are and what's the difference between playing with a cipher and playing as a, a distinct character and how that affects uh, the narrative immersion and empathy in games. What do you think? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. I like surprise questions. Excellent. Well, it's not really a surprise. Um, so ciphers, in case you're unaware of what that means, a cipher is a main character in a game that you are playing that is basically does not have their own personality distinct from you as a player. You are basically occupying them as yourself. So we call them a cipher. Um, a non-cipher character would be someone like um, Aloy in Horizon Zero Dawn. Not a cipher at all. She is who she is. You get to influence some of the color of her choices. Really, she's Aloy. Um, as opposed to another game where you're just smashing things and it's you being cool. Um, so what is the difference between these two aspects and why we would choose them for a game? And how do you think they impact um, the experience of the narrative? I think it's one of the most important decisions that you make and it really depends on the game. Like some games should be cipher driven and some games should not. Um, I feel like we could probably like make a laundry list almost of all the things that are impacted by this. One of the big ones for me of why choose a cipher is um, because you get to have alignment from the beginning between the player and the player character, right? Mm -hmm. Because you do, if you don't choose a cipher, you need to bring the player up to speed on the history of the character, their motivations, what's their personality, so that you know why they're making the choices that they are. If you um, make, like, this this is why so many, um, like, detective games, the player character has amnesia, is because even though they're a specific person with specific um, a role in the world, they have a job, they have an age, people respond to them, like, they're whatever, a 60-year-old grizzled detective or whatever, um, the player is in alignment from the beginning because they're like, where am I? What am I doing? What, you know. So that's one thing I would add is like, there's a lot of work. Neocab, the game we're in right now, has a non-cipher character, and it was like a huge challenge to bring the player up to speed with who Lena is, what's her deal, why does she do what she does, you know, all of those things, um, while keeping the like, the story moving along in the way you want like a, a story to go, which is like, let's get let's get into it, let's get into action, let's get into conflict, you know. Do you two think that um, going with a non-cipher, which is, it sounds like more challenging, right? Is it also an opportunity though, to put the player in a skin of an experience they may not be familiar with and have them integrate mm -hmm. with that? Definitely. I kind of want to jump in and steal this with a question to the two of you. What do you guys think of a cipher character evolving into non-cipher? I'm thinking of, the original Planescape Torment mm. with the Amnesia character and then you're slowly unraveling the history because of the impact that they've made everywhere. And I haven't played that in years, but I think you figure out a different kind of ending or personality depending on what you're doing. And I found that fascinating. What about you guys? Um, I love Planescape Torment. It's actually, I think, my husband's favorite video game. Um, and that's an interesting way of thinking about that question because when you're playing at first, I guess you're right. Like he really is a cipher other than being a him. Um, but that definitely changes as his like really dreadful past is revealed right over the course of the game. The interesting part is the ability to choose kind of whatever path or ending that you want is still cipher esque. So maybe that's a, a like a weird hybrid um example where like they just perfectly blended it and it worked yeah yeah that, it's really interesting i didn't so i've never played it um it's one of those games that's like people have told me is the most important game i need to play forever and like i just 
<laughs> I'm trying, guys. It's on my stupid. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's so interesting to hear that's another amnesia case because that is, it is like uh, as a narrative device, such a great way to have your cake and eat it too, right? You can, and especially to hear that the character eventually gets their memories back, right? Because then you've had all that time to get player player character alignment on lock, and now you have all the benefits of having a character with a real aspect, history, place in the world, which is like, my protagonist has attributes and is tied in with the other characters in a meaningful way, you know, like basically core elements in almost any truly, like, in my opinion, any narrative, like, I don't know, there's like, I just think there's, a, there's only so far you can go with storytelling where you, your player character doesn't have like basic character traits, like, you know, a place in society, a relation to other characters who know them, like it's, a, it, it's extremely limiting. So um, yeah, that's really interesting. More amnesia in games, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, so we do need to finish up. Um, so let's do a last round of who we are, um, where you can find us and why we're super cool. Um, Cassandra, do you wanna lead us off? Um, I'm Cass Call on Twitter. Everything I'm working on from my day job to my freelance projects is under NDA contract. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's imagination is the greatest spice. So I'm just like, like you could you're probably work on something fucking amazing. Um, I am happy to say uh, I can talk about my thing. It's called NeoCab. Um, we're also showing at Luna Narcon. So if you go to the NeoCab Steam, Steam page, you'll see my team showing all the great stuff they've been working on for the past two years. Um, our our uh, story lead is talking about how she makes a character from scratch. Our um, our art director is showing how he developed the visual style for the game. Our um, our UX designer showed how our emotion system works, which I'm like so stoked, especially people who are watching this panel. I'm really excited to hear what you guys think of our emotional like feedback system. And um, so please watch that talk. Uh, it'll be looping all weekend. Oh, and we also have a free demo. So you can download and play the first um, night of NeoCab. Um, and I'm super excited about that. And thanks um, thanks to all the folks at Luton Aircon for having, having me on. Yeah, so um, thanks everybody in chat for joining us today. We are really excited to have you. And we did peek at some of your questions uh, and they made us think a lot. Uh, again, my name is Strix. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the underscore Strix. Uh, I am also working under really heavy NDA on several things that are super cool, uh, but I will be able to talk about them soon. So that's why you should follow me on Twitter. Um, go read my academic papers if you feel like torturing yourself. And otherwise, uh, we will see you all online. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, bye. thanks for being us all. Bye, bye, bye. Bye.